My name is Miguel Roman. <laughs> I'd like to share a story with you guys about an event in my life that transformed me from the very beginning and is still transforming me to this day. Um, before I start that event, I want you to give you a little history about um, how I was raised, the decisions I made as a youth, um, the impact of those decisions, and how I overcame and continue to overcome. Um, my parents were from Puerto Rico. Um, they migrated to, to New York when I was very young, too. And, um, you know, life in New York uh, at two years old and just growing up was kind of difficult. To say the least, we were poor. Um, it, was, it was a struggle in our neighborhood. You know, I mean, we lived next to a police precinct. There were drugs being sold right next door to us. Prostitution was live. Um, you know, it was almost like there was a competition between poor people of let's show you how poor we're not. So it kind of like dro drove people to, to spend the little that they did have and flaunt what they didn't as well. So, you know, me growing up, it, 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 was, it was rough. You know, I made, it's like, a, to say that I didn't have a role model at, at, at my house was, was an understatement. My mom worked as, as a secretary. My dad was a, was a fabricator. He worked with his hands. They showed me hard work. That's, that's a role model right there. I gravitated to the role models from the street, which were the drug dealers, which was everybody that didn't do what productive people do in our society. It just forced me to speed through my teens. I can't, I can't tell you that I remember my teens. You know, I can't even say that I remember my 20s. But um, it was a ride. I had my first child at 17. I was in high school, I had to quit day school, go to night school, and work construction. Working construction in the early 90s was, uh, was rough, especially for somebody that just didn't have no education, no skill, no network. It was just hard to, 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 to enter the workforce without being equipped. And I think that, uh, I don't like to use the word minority, but as a young man, in, in growing up in the inner city, in, 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 a, in urban New York City, the Bronx, it's just hard. It's hard when you have a, no education, it's hard when you have a child, it's hard when you, ha you don't have a support network. So I made, um, I made the decision to try to do the best I could with what I had, which wasn't much. Shortly after, I had another kid, and the cycle kept going. You know, trying to adopt that same mentality that, that let's, let's show everybody how poor we're not, using those valuable resources that we needed to show people what we tried to have but really didn't have. Um, I made a lot of bad decisions as a, as a just, just growing up in that environment. I made a lot of bad decisions as a father, I made a lot of bad decisions as, as somebody who was supposed to help somebody raise kids at the same time. I lived in the street. My mom only thought I was gonna get a, a diploma from the street, and I probably think I do have a diploma in the street, but it's really not worth anything. Um, in 2004, I, went, I, I was going Christmas shopping for my kids. Somebody robbed me at gunpoint. I was in the car, I was right in front of my building. Somebody just, I, Parking is so tight in New York that, you know, like if you just bump the car behind you, you know, something's gonna happen, you know, if that person's there. So I thought it was that type of altercation. I bumped somebody's car, I heard, I heard a, a banging on my window, and when I looked, there was somebody with a shotgun right there. He shot through the window, he opened the door, and while I'm, while I'm in motion trying to just leave that situation, he took my money and he shot my arm. The, the, the muzzle to the gun was so close that I thought it was gonna go into my chest. My, my jacket just blew up like a balloon. I didn't feel anything because the adrenaline was pumping. I tried to drive myself to the hospital. I had a stick shift car. I don't know if anybody knows how to drive a stick shift while they've been shot in the arm, but I was very erratic. To say the least, I am driving erratic. The police are chasing me now. That situation went from worse to even more hectic. While they stopped me, they were like, freeze, put your hands up. I'm like, my left arm is shot. 
I'm screaming at them. They're at a distance. They can't really hear me. They thought I stole the car because there was a big hole in, in, in the window. And I'm Puerto Rican, of course, so it fits the description in the Bronx. But um, so that turned into a little debacle. Finally, I got to the hospital. I was treated. Man, if I, like, I don't think healthcare should be this way. I've heard a lot of examples of what healthcare should be. What I got wasn't healthcare. I remember being revived on a gurney after surgery. I had seven debridement surgeries just to remove the shrapnel from my arm, only to be revived like they were just going, heave, ho, and then just do do. Then I would be taken to like a pre op area, a, a PACU area, which is the area that people go to after surgery to be just like crazy thirsty, like I just drank a cup of sand and nobody there to give me a cup of water. I mean, there was people in earshot that heard me that did nothing. That shaped who I wanted to be for people that didn't have, you know, that, 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 that infrastructure in place, that support network in place for patients that, you know, that, that shouldn't be subjected to this type of care. I didn't become a health care worker right away. I, I still, uh, after like a couple of years of therapy, I, I went back to work construction with uh, one good arm. And, um, and I thrived, you know, I did work that uh, not too many people thought that somebody, you know, could do with one arm, with, with one dominant arm at that. But I felt something was missing. I mean, I had just finished the biggest project of my life, Yankee Stadium, and after that, the recession hit. There was no hope for no construction worker. There was no hope for pretty much, you know, nobody in my, in my field. So um, two years prior to, to that happening, I took a plane to meet, uh, to meet my parents, who I was very distanced from. Just because of the decisions I made as a, as a youth, as a young man, um, it kind of alienated me from that family network, which is very important for somebody who's growing up, who has kids. And um, it's important for everybody. I've heard that theme mentioned a lot of times today, family. Family is very important. I was sitting next to this young man, and he was kind of antsy. His dad comes up and says, hey, I got an aisle seat back there. You want to trade? I said, yeah, no problem. You want to sit next to your son? So I figured, you know, I was doing a good deed. I went back and took his aisle seat, and lo and behold, I met my wife on that plane. We got married two years ago. We have two kids to add to the other five that I have. <laughs> um, you know, I took a dive. You know, when the recession hit, she moved first to Texas. And I said, man, I really don't feel, feel good about this move. I'm from New York, from the Bronx. Uh. You know what I'm saying? It's just like uh, I was going to be out of my element. Everything that I knew, everything that I slept, breathed was New York. I took that dive, and I, and I knew I wanted to be a healthcare worker. It was between a nurse and an x-ray tech because during that time in the hospital, there was only one nurse that cared about me, the wound care nurse. She would come in every day and remove my, remove my dressing. I was in the hospital for eight months because the hole was so big, my bone did not fuse, it's completely fractured. I have a steel rod in my arm. And um, so they kept me in the hospital for that long because they wanted, they wanted the wounds to close before they released me. And I used to get constant x-rays. They wanted to see the progress of, of, of the wounds to see how, how, how good I'm getting during that whole time. They would put me in these little capsules called hydro, hydrobaric um, chambers, just pump 100% oxygen to try to promote healing and get me, get me out of the hospital faster. So it was between nursing and x-ray tech. I chose x-ray tech. I made the decision just to just dive into it. You know, I'm, I wasn't a, I heard labels too as a theme and you know, I had, I had put a label on myself that I was just, eh, I was probably part of that dumb circle maybe average circle in between. Upon, um, upon registering for HCC in the radiology program, I found, that, I found a different label. I found out that I was part of the A team, the, the, the elite circle of, of people who just poured their heart into what they're doing and focused and had passion. And I graduated at the top of my class with an associate's degree on Mother's Day 2012. That was just my first accomplishment. I was still hungry, New York. Oh. 
I enrolled for, for an advanced level certificate at HCC again, simultaneously with my bachelor's program at UTMD Anderson. That was hectic. Wow. <laughs> but I did it. I got, my, I got my CT certification. I got my bachelor's degree two years later in business, in business administration in, in, in a radiology setting. And I graduated at the top of my class again. I was still part of that A team. I'm still hungry. I'm from New York. <laughs> I, reg I, I applied to TWU for my MBA because I know I needed a, a, a regardless if I want to make change in healthcare, because I feel that healthcare needs like a renaissance, as, as you as you all been, been hearing, I feel like I want to be part of that re renaissance, but that renaissance doesn't just start with one, peop one person. It starts with, you know, a, a, a collaboration between people that care and people that want to see people succeed and development that you know, I figured I needed to know the business aspect of healthcare, so I, I enrolled in, into the MBA program at TWU, and uh, uh, I graduated in two months. <laughs> but um, I mean, it's, it, I, I don't say this to boast. I don't say this to, to, to just puff air into my lungs. I say this because there's other people out there from, from neighborhoods that I grew up in that don't think that it's possible, that don't think that Man, we, we, we stuck here. You know, there's no way out for us. There's, there's, there's hope for us. We just have to be accountable for our, to ourselves and hold the people that, we're, that we elect into office responsible too. There's tons of role models out here, but we have to make that decision to want to invest in our community. And it starts with us. It, it definitely starts in the house, in the home. I know there's a lot of single parents out there. I know there's a lot of single fathers out there. That, that component still is, is able to thrive and still is able to, to show their kids that we can do something different than what our parents, my parents moved here for a better life, a better life for us. But um, at the same time, they wanted us to, to, to elevate our status, not to remain the same, like stay at that same level that they came. With that said, we, want, we should want that for ourselves. We should want that for our children. Our neighborhoods are in dire need of role models, of men and women to step up. Because at the end of the day, we are leaders, but we're not tomorrow's leaders. Tomorrow's leaders are inside our, our, our living rooms, they're in our, our bedrooms, they're on our playgrounds. And we need to, we need to foster that, we need to streamline that, that information, that, that that caring, that knowledge. We have to care about our own, you know, epicenter where we live at. And if that's our, our, and if our communities are lacking, then we need to do something about it. There's a lot of movements out there, hashtag this, hashtag that, but we need to be our own hashtag. Hashtag I care about me. I heard you can't love nobody if you don't love yourself. That's a big question I tell people. Do you love yourself? The first thing they say, yeah, I love myself. What are you doing to show that you love yourself? I answered that question the same way for 36 years. Yeah, I love myself. You don't see the cars I got. The dr I wasn't doing anything. I was showing the world how much I didn't love myself. And until I was able to consciously answer that question and validate it with my actions, that's when I started to love myself. That's why... I that's how I'm able to project that love to everybody I serve, everybody. I share this story with everybody. Sometimes I feel like I should just record it. Because <laughs> all of my patients come and sometimes I see my patients feel happy, sometimes they're sad, sometimes they're in the middle. And it's my job to, to get them to where they need to be, to make them feel comfortable, to, to make them feel that they came to the right place and, they, and, they, and they're with the right person. I touch my patients on the leg sometimes. I say, I got you. I said, if nobody ever said they got you, I got you. And I try to translate my experience and, and transform their experience to, to, to be an experience that, that's memorable, that they can say, what's your name again? Because I do intro introduce myself. I make that connection, and I try to be funny just to, just to break the ice, and I try to be caring, empathetic, and do a lot of things that just... Not everybody does, but I love my job, and I love what I do for people, and at the same time, 
I feel like I'm responsible for the people that are coming behind me. And my message is to everybody, you know, if you take one thing from this, you know, become that block. I am in no shape or form an architect, but I'm a building block. And we already know who the, who the, who the main architect is. The, the, the event that happened to me, that somebody used for my harm, somebody used for my good and transformed me. And he could transform anybody. We just have to want to be transformed. We have to want to be molded. And that, and, and that goes with sharing our experiences and, um, and showing our kids. Because I used to always tell my kids, do this, do this, do this. And you know what? They never did that. They never did that. And so they, I, I followed the same model. And I have great parents. I love my parents. My mom was my arch nemesis growing up. She's my best friend now. And my dad followed the same model. And I got a loving family. And it starts in the family. And I just want everybody to know that we have to be responsible for, 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 for streamlining that, that, that responsibility to our kids and letting them know they care. And it is possible to change. And electing people that we hold responsible to what we need in our communities. There's no reason why our children should be playing around where crack vials or anything is at our playground. We have the ability to get that cleaned up and we have the ability to say we don't want drugs sold in our neighborhood. And just, I just, I just wanted to, just to say thank you to TWU for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.